Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our webinar is beginning. I'm Steve Love, President and CEO of the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council. We're delighted to have another educational webinar today that's hosted in coordination with BKD, CPAs, and advisors. And they're also an associate member of the Hospital Council. Today, we're going to be talking about environmental, social, and governance standards. And our topic is the changes here, ESG. As you know, BKD is a national CPA and advisory firm, and they're going to help explain and help you understand how to reach your goals. This expertise goes beyond the standard accounting because it also includes risk management, technology, wealth management, forensic and valuation services. They represent a wide range of industry, and they're an integral part of alliances of firms that gives a reach not only here in North Texas or Texas, but across the globe. But today we're gonna, as I said, focus on ESG. And we're delighted our guest speaker is gonna be Dirk Cochran, who's a managing director of ESG at BKD. Now, I know some of the ESG reporting requirements may not be applicable to many of you that are participating in this webinar today. However, it is felt they're going to trickle down to your industry and specifically the hospital and healthcare industry. So the point of this presentation is not only to bring you up to speed on ESG, but to educate the participants in a way to help your organization be more prepared and mindful of potential future requirements. I think Dirk is going to explain to us its drivers, its frameworks, reporting options, and how best for you to begin building your program. We're all looking forward to this exciting presentation. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Dirk Cochran. All right, thank you, Steve. I appreciate that that uh, generous introduction, um, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak here in front of the hospital council about ESG. Um, I'm going to dive right in and um, see, make sure I can get my. There we go. Um, Steve uh, walked walked us through my table of contents here, but I'll I'll uh, go through it quickly. I want to talk about what it, ESG is, kind of how it came to be, what it is today, um, the demographic drivers behind that. Uh, there's several ESG frameworks that um, are, are uh, available for people to use. Going to go through those, talk about reporting best practices, and then um, how, how to get kicked off uh, for your organization. So what is ESG? Well, ESG is just a, an acronym uh, for environmental, social, and governance, but it's a, a set of metrics or standards for about an or organization's operations that people are increasingly or stakeholders are increasingly asking for. And it's about the organization's impacts in those three areas and how the organization addresses those impacts, particularly for environmental and social. What are the company's impacts? How do they manage those? And then on the governance side, it's really how the how the organization overall manages itself. Um, for hospitals, this is going to be um, donors and, and grantees. It can even be, those are usually the, the most important, but it can be employees, it can be um, you know, banks if, you, if you're borrowing money, uh, suppliers, even the community in which you operate in. Um, and ESG co covers a wide range of topics that you know aren't associated normally. We're not prior to recent time thought of as 
part of the organization's financial picture. So it's mostly non-financial metrics. Um, so for environmental, it's how the organization impacts the environmental and how the organization manages those impacts. For social, it really has anything to do with people, how an organization manages its relationships with its employees, customers, vendors, and the community where, where the organization operates. And then governance is how an organization oversees the control and, and direction of itself. Um, environmental factors, uh, what I've got here in the in the oval are metrics. Um, so environmental factors, uh, you know, the top hot topic now, uh, you know, in the paper every day and um, in the consciousness of a, of a lot of people is climate and carbon emissions, um, which is very closely linked to energy efficiency and waste management. These are the metrics for the healthcare industry. Um, and the way that people use this data is to compare, for example, emissions from one organization to another, and also trends, you know, are your emissions or is your inner energy efficiency getting better or worse over time um, particularly on the climate side stakeholders are interested in how the organization overall thinks about and manages climate related risks and opportunities we're going to talk a little bit later about what that what that means climate related risk and opportunities i've got some examples um, and then waste, and if you in the news today, you know, plastic waste, plastic waste in the ocean um, are you know a, a concern, and so stakeholders are interested in if you use plastics, how do you dispose of those, uh, and how what efforts or initiatives do you have in place to increase uh, recycling? So those are some environmental metrics and examples of how stakeholders use that information. Um, on the social side, which for the healthcare industry is where most of the, the uh, metrics are, you know, as a, uh, just the nature of the, the business is uh, you're helping people. And so um, metrics for the healthcare industry are how the organization deals with patient privacy and, uh, and electronic health records, um, <clears throat> how they, uh, organization manages access for low-income patients. Um, do you measure quality of care and patient satisfaction? Um, how you manage controlled substances, pricing and billing transparency, your own workforce, your own employees, uh, health and safety, um, gender and diversity in your organization, and then how you um, recruit, develop, and retain talent, which, you know, in today's environment is so, so important. Um, the, but those are metrics uh, on the social side for healthcare. Um, how stakeholders use this information, for example, cybersecurity. Um, there was a, an article on the front page of the Wall Street Journal that had to do with cybersecurity and healthcare. Um, and so, you know, stakeholders are interested in how the organization uh, manages cybersecurity infrastructure and what processes you have in place to protect customer and employee data. Um, how the or an organization uh, encourages diversity and inclusion uh, in their recruitment and in their management. You know, just how how they overall approach that. Um, and then human rights issues for uh, the health and welfare of your of your employees and in the the community where you, you operate. Um, so again, those are social metrics and how how examples of how stakeholders use that that information. On the governance side, <clears throat> it's uh, who sits on your board, your governing board. Um, what kind of backgrounds do they have? What are their qualifications? Um, what's their experience? How are the committee structure, structured? What are the roles and responsibilities of board committees? 
Um, how are executives compensated? Does that, for example, include any consideration of ESG uh, measures? Um, what the organization has in place, programs you have in place to prevent fraud or specific to the healthcare industry, unnecessary pre procedures. Um, how organizations manage lobbying to make sure, for example, that your lobbyists, people who are lobbying on your behalf are communicating the same message that uh, the organization is publicly stating. Um, how the, the organization controls political contributions and whether or not and what your whistleblower programs look like. Um, examples of how those factors are considered by some stakeholders. <clears throat> There's very much an interest in, <clears throat> excuse me, how management becomes aware of and manages emerging risks, things that aren't on your radar screen now. How does uh, you know, when things come up unexpectedly, how does management become aware of that? What processes is in place for to elevate up to management? And then when it's an emerging risk, one that, that the organization hasn't dealt with before, um, which, you know, definitely experienced in the last two years with COVID, um, how, how does the organization systematically manage those risks, those un, unexpected risks? Um, again, board qualification and does the board have formal oversight on these topics, ESG topics? And if you've had problems, if an organization has had problems, how have they responded to those problems? It's one thing to have the program in place, but seeing how the program, you know, if you have a whistleblower program or fraud prevention programs, um, but seeing if, if if you have the unfortunate situation where something does happen, how did the organization respond to that? Um, you know, ESG is a common topic. It's in the news frequently. Um, and so I think it's good to, to go back and how, how it came to, to be what it is today. Um, it really started in the, and is, and is furthest along in the finance industry um, it began back in 2004 um, when the UN Secretary General really challenged the finance industry to think beyond just the income statement and the balance sheet and integrate these non-financial factors into how they, uh, you know, affect the capital markets. Um, and the actual term itself was coined in a in a uh, study or a report titled who cares wins and in that report um, the case was made that if you take esg factors into investment decisions they make you know they make good business sense and could lead to more sustainable markets really 2004 or 5 is when it first came into being um, fast forward to today, start at the bottom of this slide. This is actually a, over a year old now. Where in the finance industry, some of the largest, the largest money managers in the world um, are really pushing public companies um, to disclose uh, to specific standards, which we're going to talk about, and um, and uh, making saying they're making uh, decisions about that. This isn't the first time that, you know, that this kind of investing thinking didn't start with ESG. There's been a social responsible investment uh, movement that's been around for decades. It primarily started with um, religious organizations where, where they um, created funds that uh, invested in companies that were in line with their beliefs. And um, really it's evolved now to where, um, you know, there are multiple ESG uh, products available, um, with all kinds of different criteria that, that are uh, honing in on, on investments um, based upon people's um, interests in, in ESG topics. Um, more recently, uh, on the regulatory front, um, 
President Biden issued a uh, an executive order early this year, and um, as a result of that, asking or directing several departments to to consider climate um, in their uh, you know, the way that they're they're operating their departments, and and so the August 30th. The uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services established the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. Um, the mission of that office is to protect the health of people throughout the U U.S. in the face of climate change, and especially those experiencing a higher share of exposure and impact. So I'm not going to read every one of these sub bullets, but um, I will point down to the, uh, the fourth one which is to assist with regulatory efforts to reduce emissions throughout the healthcare sector, including participating suppliers and providers. I'm gonna say this again later, but in the healthcare sector, um, much of the emissions uh, in the healthcare sector is thought to um, be associated with goods and services that the healthcare industry purchases. And so that's, actually the, the way that a hospital can um, most effectively, you know, improve their emissions profile is often through their suppliers. Uh, so I want to point that out because it is a specific mandate here to, to or part of their mission to, um, to assist with those regulatory efforts. I'll also point out that if you go through these bullets, there's ref many references to vulnerable populations, uh, community health resilience, um, public health benefits, um, you know, disadvantaged communities and vulnerable populations. Um, and so there, there very much is this theme along, um, you know, protecting those uh, parts of the community where they may have uh, the most impact from uh, climate change. And this is not only a theme that's in the, the Health and Human Services uh, organization here, it's a theme in, in multiple um, federal agencies in the Biden administration. The, the um, Environmental Protection Agency also uh, has this theme of protecting um, disadvantaged communities um, as well uh, as kind of environmental justice, you might hear it referred to that way. Um, and so if your organization, um, you know, su supports those communities or is located in some of those communities, I think there's going to be opportunities for, for organizations to um, you know, team up with with uh, the federal government and and uh, develop programs uh, around um, helping protect those those disadvantaged communities. Um, a couple points there. Again, on the the regulatory efforts to reduce emissions, um, the importance of suppliers and service providers. And then just this theme of, of disadvantaged communities um, and focus on, on protecting those communities. Um, the other major development regulatory wise is, um, is an SEC rule that's expected. So in March of 2021, the SEC requested public comment on, on a mandatory climate change disclosure for public companies. Um, and in July, the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, uh, provided remarks about that, what comments they'd gotten. Um, and the bottom line message, uh, my interpretation of what Mr. Gensler said at, at that uh, presentation was, they've got overwhelming interest requests asked for the investment community um, from the investment community asking regulators to make uh, a climate related disclosure mandatory um, and to make it uh, somewhat prescriptive so that it's com more comparable across organizations. And if you're not a public company, you th might think, well, this isn't maybe particularly relevant to me, but um, it's 
written, or at least the, the uh, feedback that uh, SEC has put out is that it's written around a standard, which we're gonna go into a little bit of detail on around the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, the TCFD. Um, it's a set of recommendations that have been around for a few years. So many large, the largest public companies are issuing reports under this framework. And um, insofar as this trickles down into other uh, you know, ways where federal funding is provided or in federal procurement environment where they're comparing suppliers or approving um, reimbursements and, you know, if they want climate change information, um, it's going to look most likely like this is my prediction um, because this is quickly becoming the, the standard. Um, and uh, it's it's actually mostly qualitative. Um, how does the the organization think about climate related risks and opportunities? How do they manage those? Um, how does that affect the company's strat or, or the organization's strategy? Um, on the hard some harder parts of it though are quantifying uh, an organization's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the financial impacts of, of climate change. Um, there's some scenario analysis, which is really a very forward-looking um, analysis on how different possible future uh, climate change scenarios might affect an organization's business. Um, and then if, if the organization makes a, some commitments like net zero, uh, you know, many organizations today have made net, net zero commitments, but the detail in that commitment is very important. And so the, uh, the rule, at least uh, Gensler has indicated that the rule they're considering specifying, requiring that if you make that kind of commitment, you have to specify what portions of your emissions are included in that commitment and provide metrics for your stakeholders to know if progress is being made. So, um, uh, a, a lot to uh, that, that the SEC is considering here. There is an update to this. Originally, when he, Mr. Gensler, talked about this in July of 2021, uh, he indicated that he had asked staff to have the rule um, for consideration by the end of 2021. Um, he spoke in on September 20th and and uh, provided an update and said that may be by the end of 2021 or it could be early 2022. So I think uh, he indicated that this writing this rule is complex and um, and so they may may require more time. So those are some regulatory developments. Um, but really, if you take a step back, and say, well, what's happening overall that's driving this interest in the ESG is really a, a demographic um, driver. And that is in the finance world, um, you know, there is a historic time over the next 25 years, gonna be the largest transfer of wealth in the, in the history of the world. Um, between 2020 and 2045, it's uh, estimated that 48 trillion and assets is going to change hands from baby boomers to the to the Gen X and millennial um, and millennials. And um, this is believed to be, you know, we're only now one year into that 25 year period, um, but uh, it's believed to be one of the driving forces of ESG um, because. Uh, Millennials, uh, as a demographic group, tend to, to care more about where their dollars are invested uh, in, care more that their dollars are invested in companies that have good performance on an environmental and social metrics. Um, and there's a, been a shift in thinking within the finance industry that really, because it's been increasingly showing that these non-financial 
uh, metrics drive financial outcomes that it's increasingly being seen as part of a fiduciary duty to consider and integrate ESG considerations and in, uh, investment decisions. So really just here at the beginning of um, a, a large trend and um, you know, what I coach our clients on is that now is the time to get good at ESG and um, develop the muscle, if you will, to uh, do the reporting and, and stay on top of what is really a, a dynamic place. Um, this is a chart of, of uh, fund flows uh, in the mutual fund business to sustainable, sustainable funds from Morningstar. And um, it's Q2 of 2021 on the far right. Notice near the middle there is Q2 of, of uh, 2020. So in one year, it almost doubled. It went from $159 billion uh, fund flows in Q2 to um, 303, not quite double, billion dollars. And so this is one of the fastest growing areas in the finance uh, um, financial management region area. And so um, finance companies are creating products uh, really, you know, to meet demand from their customers who are interested in, in uh, sustainable investing. Um, and so as, a, as an organization um, in the ESG world, there's a fair amount of flexibility because it is now, at least in the United States, a um, voluntary voluntary reporting. There are standards that have evolved, and and um, four I got here what I consider kind of the four most commonly used. I'm going to walk through each one of these a little bit. One is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board (SASB). Um, for those of you with accounting and finance background, it's, it's no coincidence that it's uh, almost the same acronym as FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Um, the SASB organization has really been deliberate in, in modeling itself after FASB and following their standard setting um, methodology uh, with the thought that someday this is gonna be a common reporting framework. Um, the other one, which has been around longer and for, for organizations that have been reporting, doing sustainability or corporate social responsibility um, reports are uh, typically have used the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI. Um, the other one, which I already talked about, which is a few years old now, is the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure. And then the, the newest one on here, but also one that um, has gotten widespread use is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs, the UN SDGs, you'll hear, hear them referred to. Um, so to dive into these and talk a little bit about where they overlap and, and how they're the same or different, um, compare and contrast them, SASB, uh, really looks at it from a, a lens of how the organization issues affect the organization and its financial performance. It was written by financial professionals, the standards were. They're organized by industry. They're gonna look more like a kind of standard accounting standard, uh, your typical accounting standard. Um, and they have identified what they consider to be the most likely to be financial important by industry sector. They've got standards for over 70 industries, each with their own unique set of, of metrics, um, which allows for comparability between organizations within the same industry. And so I have here the tables uh, from the healthcare uh, healthcare delivery standard, SASB standard. Um, and just to walk through those, you know, energy management, waste management, these were on my earlier slides, patient privacy, um, access for lower income patients. Um, you'll notice in the, if you look across the columns there, that it's either a quantitative metric 
or a like an MDNA, a management discussion and analysis metric. So some of these metrics are really describe your program or your policies and practices around a certain topic. And then the others are, you know, quantitative measures for that topic. The amount of, for example, the amount of energy that you consume as an organization, the percentage that's from the grid and the percentage that's renewable. Those are, you know, things that you can measure and count. Um, moving on, additional within the healthcare delivery is um, quality of patient care and patient satisfaction, uh, management of controlled substances, pricing and, and billing transparency. Um, one I'll talk about here is um, the uh, second row there is the number of serious reportable events as defined by the National Quality Forum. Now, hopefully your hospital, and I think many hospitals don't have any of those. Uh, they might have a zero. And so people um, say, well, if I don't have any, why, why would I report on it? Well, in the context of, of ESG reporting, oftentimes zero is the best number to report. And, and it's a good thing. Zero is a number, I like to say. And, uh, and so if it's zero, that doesn't mean it's not applicable to you. It means that that's, that's something you still should consider for reporting. Um, continuing on with the metrics as employee health and safety incident rates, um, employee recruitment, development, retention, uh, climate change impacts on human health and infrastructure, and then broad programs around fraud and unnecessary procedures. Um, take a minute to look at the climate change one, because this does very much overlap with the TCFD. So what they're asking for is a description of policies and practices to address the physical risk due to an increased frequency and intense of extreme weather events. So this is flooding, um, you know, hurricanes, heat waves. Um, you know, how, how does your organization manage that? Uh, then the second one is changes in morbidity and mor mortality rates of illness and diseases associated with climate change. Um, there are certain parts of the world that have greater exposure to um, uh, climate change events. Again, hurricanes, heat waves, and um, you know, if, if uh, your organization has any practices to address uh, if those events become more frequent or more severe. Um, so that kind of ends the accounting metrics. Then they they have uh, activity metrics. And so these activity metrics are designed so that the users of this information can compare organizations of different size and complexity. So here for the healthcare industry, it's number of facilities and beds by type, um, number of inpatient admissions and outpatient visits. So that if you're a small hospital, they can compare your performance to a large hospital vice versa, and just kind of know the size of your organization um, from, from that, the, those metrics. Um, so that's SASB. GRI um, is different. GRI is based, although there is a, a lot of overlap, GRI is based on the concept that uh, you know, organizations place value on different ESG metrics. Um, there's three universal standards, which um, tend to be about the organization and uh, the governance of the organization and then topic specific standards. And whereas SASB specifies what you should report for your organization, um, GRI has a materiality analysis process. They just updated this standard. Um, so this slide is based upon on the old standard, but I think in spirit, it's it's the same. Um, and that is the significance of the organization's effects on the uh, economy, environment, and society, um, whether that's those effects are good or positive or negative uh, to sustainable development. 
and then the substantive influence uh, on the stakeholders and how they make decisions on um, you know how they interact with your organization um, and your it specifically calls out getting feedback from employees shareholders contractors and suppliers local communities uh, vulnerable vulnerable groups and and uh, civil society um, and so there's a stakeholder um, a structured way to interact and get feedback on these these and this is a it's commonly the outcome of that process is a heat map um, and this is an example from a healthcare uh, organization and so on the x-axis we've got impact on business success that's the businesses the organization's perspective and on the y-axis here um, uh, what stakeholders thought was important and and you might see if you look at at uh, organizations they might flip this the other way where stakeholders are on bottom and and the organization is on the y-axis so in this example both the organization and stakeholders felt that access to healthcare, price and affordability, product innovation, sales and marketing practices were, were most important uh, uh, for, in this case, like ESG reporting. And so those were things you would be definitely reporting on. The other things that they're at least starting with, so you would start with the things in the upper right hand corner and maybe not do the things in the lower, not do reporting and measurement on the things in the lower left-hand corner, or you might do those, but get to them not, not your highest priority. Um, but not only in the upper right corner, but, but also most organizations will start with um, anything that stakeholders thought was really important or the business thought uh, was really important. So in this example, in the lower right-hand corner, um, stakeholders did not think that talent attraction and retention was that important for the organization, but the organization itself thought that that's highly important. And so that would be, most organizations are going to report on that, uh, those things that are thought to be highly important by, by either group. Um, so there's more flexibility with GRI uh, in what what you might report, whereas SASB says this is what you should report for your organization if it applies. SASB also has some flexibility there if your organization might not exactly fit into their industry category, or you might be complex and fit into multiple industry categories. Um, TCFD is different. TCFD is laser focused on climate. Um, and it's got four things that they're looking for governance strategy risk management metrics and targets and this is all climate so um i think in my experience it's kind of an un for business people it's a, a bit of an unnatural analysis in that you're being asked to create this treat this risk as if it is the most important risk to your organization um, and maybe the only risk that you think about. And so, you know, in an organization's managing dozens, if not hundreds of risks on a day-to-day -day basis, it's a little bit different to create, give so much focus to one risk, but that's what the TCFD does. Um, and I'll point out here that uh, in this Venn diagram, notice that the governance circle is the largest. Um, there is a premium put on uh, not only in the TCFD, but I think in the ESG world in general, on governance. And um, sometimes it's the easiest step you can take and also the most effective step that you can take uh, is getting things in front of your board uh, kind of routinely. Um, and so, you know, governance is give, given a, a premium. Um, one thing about the TCFD disclosure uh, recommendations is that it's a lengthy document. It was written by committee and it, it reads like it was written by committee. Um, it also is complex and they put out a lot of guidance written by other committees to try to help with that complexity. Um, so it can be difficult to understand. 
but they did provide one table that summarizes the whole standard. And um, this is that table. Um, it's the, the lower three rows are, if you address the, the, uh, the, the disclosure recommendations in those lower three rows, you basically done, you've done the standard. So it's 11 things you need to disclose. And what I like to, I like to point out a few things. Most of them start with the word describe. Um, you'll notice in the first three columns, they all are describe. Um, and in the third column, it's one uh, um, is described. And so it's a narrative about how your organization thinks about and manages these, these uh, issues. I'll also point out that the words climate related risks or climate related risk is in almost every one of those uh, items. Um, and all but risk management, which is focused on risk management, include both risks and opportunities. So kind of step one is, what is a climate related risk or opportunity? Um, and so I've got some examples here from, from a healthcare organization. Um, and the top are three example risks and the bottom are three example opportunities. I like, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. so. I'll start with the opportunities. Um, you know, as uh, society is more concerned about and um, interested in climate-related issues, it's really an opportunity for differentiation for an organization. Um, if you can, uh, you know, consumers start to make more decisions about uh, you know organization's reputation based upon its environmental performance, um, it's an opportunity for an organization to be really good at environmental, managing their environmental impacts and a way to differentiate themselves from, from other organizations. Um, it's also, you know, uh, climate and emissions are, are highly tied to efficiency, whether that's building efficiency, um, uh, in any kind of energy use efficiency, and that's an opportunity to to reduce costs for the organization. Um, and then resilience, um, you know, has to do with if there are changes to regulations that might affect your cost in this example. Um, and there and there might be incentives in place uh, that would create opportunities, for example, to install renewable generation or uh, make your buildings more energy efficient. So there are opportunities there in the form of, of incentives. On the risk side, here, these examples, I'll go back up to the top here. Um, is that if the first one is kind of the opposite of the other, the opportunity, if you, if uh, stakeholders increasingly become concerned about the organization's environmental performance, if you don't do well at that, um, you know, they might go to take their business to other organizations. Um, on the physical risk side, you know, increased severity and frequency of extreme weather events um, could, could impact your business. Um, you know, here I live in Texas and, uh, you know, we've had our share of large hurricanes and winter storms, uh, which have had, uh, you know, big, big impacts on, on the state. Um, and then another risk that they have is uh, uncertainty in market signals, just you know, not knowing how that might affect, um, how regulatory and pricing might, might affect energy costs, uh, can be harder, might, might become harder to, um, to uh, project your energy costs. So these are just some examples um, from a healthcare organization, but it's part, this, TCFD is really trying to get organizations to think about these topics, really all with the goal of being more resilient and reducing impact. Um, and the last one I'll go through is the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so the UN set 17 individual goals, adopted them that by all of the UN members, uh, approve these goals, um, which is a 
something they have in their 2030 agenda for sustainable development. It's done in a way to link these uh, issues between both developing nations and developed nations. These are kind of very high level generic um, goals, uh, broad goals, um, and, and they're designed to provide a explicitly designed to provide a pathway to developing peace and sustainability uh, for the planet for years to come. Um, and so in ESG disclosure, you're really describing how your organization corresponds with these goals. So in the healthcare uh, industry, number three is front and center. I mean, the org your organization is designed to you know, help with good health and well-being. Um, you might also point to eight to, you know, be a, a great place to work, have a good work and providing uh, economic growth for um, your stakeholders. Uh, you know, if you've got this uh, focus on, on serving um, uh, disadvantaged communities, you know, Goal number 10, redu reduced inequalities, but really it's how the organization lines up, how you believe your organization lines up with these, with these SDGs. Um, so those are four common frameworks. Uh, on the reporting side, some best practices. Um, don't think of this as another kind of check the box exercise. Really commit to get some value out of the process and the data that comes with it. So for example, if you report on energy efficiency, my experience is you will find parts of your organization that are inefficient and you will go after those, which you know, on the energy efficiency standpoint can reduce costs for your organization. So, you know, with each of those types of data is a, a way to manage the organization and, and get better. So go into it saying, we're gonna use the data to get better. Talk to your stakeholders. People are asking for this information. Um, ask them how they're using it. Um, because a lot of times, the third one here, because a lot of times people are using this to make financial decisions. So it's important to have controls over uh, that ESG reporting and really follow the model of your financial reporting. Have the same kind of discipline and controls over financial reporting. You're gonna find that many organizations already have some of this data that they've collected for other purposes. That's a great place to start, a, a way to find some easy wins. Um, and as you develop your ESG reporting, use your financial reporting processes. I think it's always good to ask, you know, if someone asks, well, how, how should we do this? Well, what does the accounting department do? Um, is always a great way to, to ask. And you'll find things that are common in finance and accounting reporting just are not common to many people or, you know, who don't do that. Um, the difference between, you know, in, in time, considerations in time and a balance sheet versus an income statement, that kind of how you think about showing data over time versus a snapshot in time is a, um, foreign to many people, having a monthly or quarterly close process, um, which can be a great way to provide discipline in that data is not common for, for a lot of non-financial data. So there's a lot of benefits um, from building your program modeled after your financial reporting processes. Um, how to get started at BKD, we follow a four phase approach, which is assess, design, implement, monitor. It's really how we like to approach it with clients who need to or want to start building an ESG program. And we like to have in every step, how is this gonna be assured? What are the, what should be happening in each step so that we can get assurance over the data that's reported? So in the assess phase, we like to talk it's best to have executive leadership, again, this, this premium put on governance, talk about what success looks like. People are usually interested in benchmarking with their peers. I also encourage people to benchmark against some of the highest rated organizations because sometimes the highest rated organizations are doing things very different, reporting very different ways than peers are. And 
if you want to differentiate yourself, it's often best to look at the people who are rated the best. Um, again, talk to your stakeholders, go through the discussions to identify risks and opportunities, identify KPIs. Probably SASB is the best place to start, but there might be other KPIs unique to your business that are more insightful. So working through that kind of what are the best KPIs, determine which framework you want to use, or in most cases, people will use a combination of frameworks and report using a variety of, of, the, of the frameworks. Um, develop a plan, think about who your audience is, what your organization's story is. You want to keep it consistent with the existing reporting that you do. Um, identify where you're going to get the data from for each of these kind of KPIs um, and disclosures that you are going to make. Put controls in place to confirm the reliability of that data. Think about, again, I said, you know, it's good for this reporting to, to line up with how the organization approaches reporting overall. Think about how you're going to, when you do have your report available, communicate that out to your stakeholders. Um, do it in a very transparent way. Um, and then a lot of this has an IT component to it. You know, many organizations have, just like you have accounting systems for your dollars, you're going to have accounting systems for each one of those metrics. And so it's very good to go in. Um, thinking about it that way is just an accounting system for a different thing. Um, and so technology can be really important for uh, collecting and managing that data. Uh, go through the process, report, do your communication plan, and then it's a, you know, kind of a plan, do, check, act cycle here. Plan, do, check, adjust cycle. Um, see how people respond to your your stakeholders respond to your reporting, um, and based upon the feedback you get, make adjustments before you get into the next uh, the next report. And then finally, um, you know, third-party assurance on a recurring basis uh, can really enhance the reliability of the information um, reported by organizations and uh, um, a lot of value in just giving giving particularly executives comfort in the, the quality of that data. So, and with that, I'll ask uh, Steve if uh, he would come back on and field any questions that we've had. Hey, thanks a lot, Dirk. In fact, we do have some questions. You know, as you look at uh, a lot of the things that you just talked about, you know, when you think in terms of the standards related to ESG, how do you think those choices are going to impact hospitals' supply chain, which is an integral part of their business? Yeah, I think um, definitely in the healthcare industry and hospitals, it's thought that you know people who have reported their emissions, much of their emissions is not associated with their hospital is not from their own operations. It's from their suppliers uh, and the emissions associated with the, the goods and services that they supply. And so to really reduce your emissions, you've got to, sometimes the best opportunities are in your suppliers or is doing that through your suppliers. So um, you really, need a supply chain management program for for like for example on climate to consider emissions in that and some suppliers because this is becoming much and much more common some suppliers are going to have that data and be able to help you demonstrate when you make changes choices in the products you buy services you buy how that reduces your emissions but it's still early stages a lot of suppliers you're going to have to bring them along with you um, and uh, help help them put that infrastructure in place or put some milestones out them, there for them to hit uh, so that you can demonstrate how supply chain management is, you know, how you use that to manage your environmental impact, for example. Yeah, you know, I was thinking as you were doing the presentation, and as I mentioned in your introduction, 
you know, while some of uh, the people that are participating on this webinar may not be under these standards yet, they're probably going to trickle down to the healthcare industry. So based on your experience, how would you advise hospitals to choose which voluntary ESG reporting frameworks they should follow? Yeah. I like SASB a lot. SASB is very well thought out. It's um, it's very well done um, and it's concrete. And um, but if you think SASB doesn't fit your organization, you know, know that there's a systematic way to, to do that uh, to to cons do a materiality assessment through GRI, for example. I also think that TCFD is coming and it's going to become widespread use. So I, for most organizations, I think SASB and the TCFD are the best places to start. Um, but there might be considerations that would point you in different directions. Here's another good question. You know, many of the larger hospitals have internal audit departments, which obviously make sure you're in compliance and they have compliance departments, but it helps as the outside external auditors come in at year end to rely on some of the work that's been done by the internal auditors. Should you structure something similar when you look at organizations that implement ESG or should it roll up under internal audit? Just Somebody's thinking outside the box. Yeah. Uh, again, I think uh, the, it's, the great question is what what does your organ how does your organization do financial reporting, right? So internal audit doesn't usually own financial reporting. Their role is to you know help with the controls uh, and checking for the financial reporting. So I think it's the same way, like ESG. They have the same role for ESG and and the and you know internal audit is is great to have involved because they just have that data discipline that really came out of Sarbanes Oxley, um, you know having uh, practices and procedures well documented that kind of framework that that most internal audit departments have with SOX related can just be put right on top of ESG data collection. It is non-financial data, so it has different considerations, but, um, you know, it's 80% can be the same. So let me ask you a, another question. I used to, in a previous life, I was CFO at a publicly traded company. And in your presentation, you mentioned some of this might be put in the annual 10K report that you know you have to, would it be under the management discussion and analysis that you would get into some of the things you're doing, or would it be a separate schedule for the 10K? I'm just curious. Um, it's kind of, it's, there are different schools of thought on that. You know, I think, um, a a financial industry would love for it to be in the 10K, but a lot of issuing companies, you know, believe that it creates additional liability for them. And so there, while there are some people, who, some companies that are putting this information in their 10K, is definitely a very small minority right now. I think because of that consideration, a liability consideration, as well as the ESG reporting just isn't as mature as the financial reporting. So sometimes, you know, the financial reporting's done and the ESG people are still like just getting their data together. Um, and so there's a mismatch in timing. I think that's another driver. Um, but, uh, you know, there is a school of thought out there that, and really you'll see this in, the, in GRI and SASB, the best practice would be to put it in your 10K. But again, today, very few organizations are doing that. Right. Here's kind of the final question, but boy, it's a good one. 
how would you give advice to hospitals as they prepare for potential rules on disclosure for things such as climate change, board diversity, and cyber security? Yeah. I really think a, the best place to start is with the board and get it in front of the board. Again, because there's such a premium on governance and, you know, having reported to boards, um, you know, my perspective on boards is that they're, they're on the board because they're really smart, they're really successful, and guess what? They're committed to the organization's success. Um, and, you know, many of them keep up with current events, so they've, they've read about ESG and maybe even formed some opinions about it, you know, pro or con. Um, but if you can get that group thinking about it, and then they will challenge management, you know, well, what do we need to do about this? You know, can we set up some routine reporting? Um, so I, I really think a, a great first step and, and uh, you know, just say that, you know, this is coming, we're thinking about it, we want to let you know we're thinking about it, here's how we're thinking about it. Get that in front of the board, that's, that's a really great place to start. The other thing I think is just look again back at that best practices, which is where do we already have data that we're collecting that you know is considered ESG data. It's one thing to have that data. It can be another level of effort to consolidate it for the whole organization if you've got a large organization, but that's a great place to start. Well, Dirk, I think that's all the questions we have pending, but on behalf of everyone that's participated today, and especially with the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council, we can't thank you enough because you're right, change is here, and ESG is going to be so important. And thank you for a very informative uh, presentation to us today. You're welcome, Steve, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. So everyone, please have a good rest of the day and thank you for participating.